Okay. Coefficient of variation, which is what I said that it was, the formula is CV equals standard deviation. I don't know why my brain focused on turning it upside down, but it's the standard deviation over the mean, not the other way around. Or it's, if it's a sample, it's just different symbols. And we do count, we do evaluate it as a percentage, so we are going to have to change it to a percent. So for stock A, stock A, the coefficient of variation would be the standard deviation, which is 458, over the mean, which is 6150. And if you'll notice, both of those are in dollars, which is why, since they're both in dollars, this comes out not to have any units. So we take 458, divide it by the 61.50, and we get 0.0744. And if we convert that to a percentage, that's 7.4%. So we would classify that as 7.4% variation for stock A, which is small and makes sense because stock A's standard deviation is small. So you now, do multiply by 100. You do multiply it by 100. That's what threw me off when I got the answer that I did on what did I do. So. And then stock B, you're going to do the same process. So stock B has a, the same mean, 6150, but a different standard deviation, a much larger one. And I wanted to use this example because we'd already talked about the variability of stock A and stock B. So these answers kind of make sense. So here we have 0.2977. So we would call that 29.8%. So you can see that the variability in stock B is actually almost four times as much. And it actually is the same thing if you look at it this way. This is about four times as much as that. So we could have actually done a, a direct comparison just of the standard deviations and gotten the same information, but we had the same mean. Let's suppose instead of those stocks, and I'm just going to make this example up, I have two Mass 1630 classes. My Mass 1630 daytime class has taken their first test. And the mean for their test, and actually their population, so I'm going to put mu. So their mean was 78.2. And their standard deviation, on the other hand, was 19.3. And then I also have a evening class, an evening class of Math 1630. That's split between face-to-face -face and internet. Their mean score was 73.1, it was lower.
but their standard deviation was also lower. So if I want to compare the variability in my two classes, then the way that I compare the variability is doing the coefficient of variation for both of them. So if I take 19.3 over 78.2, and then I take 6.2 and divide it by 73.1, y'all do the arithmetic and convert it to a percent and tell me what I get. Okay. And what about? Excuse me? 8.5? Okay, so double check your math. Okay. What does this tell me as their teacher? What do you think? What does this tell me about their performance on the exam? I mean, obviously, this one had a higher mean. This one was a few points lower. This one was a lot more variable. In actual point of fact, there are a few more students in the daytime class than there are in the evening class, but this actually tells me that there was a lot more variability. In fact, three times as much variability in my daytime class as there was in my evening class. My evening class performed pretty consistently. They had a very small range. So they really didn't vary from each other's scores all that much. I count for it by the fact that the students that I have in my evening class are mostly working students. Um, they have a job during the day, they come to school at night, they're dead serious about their job. They're, um, the internet students that have signed up that way have the leeway to come to class if they want to, and some of them do when they can, but they've signed up for the internet class because their work schedule varies and they can't always come every uh, Monday night to a meet. So they tend to be very dedicated students. They have the same practice test, the same homework, the same quizzes, the same in-class lectures. Both classes did, but the night class was more motivated. I'm not saying that my day class was not motivated, but my day class are strictly, for the most part, students, and that's it. They don't work outside. A lot of them are fresh out of high school. They're still trying to get their feet under them. They, they don't really, but they're not sure about all this yet. This is a new thing for them, so it's harder for them to adjust. And so some of them have some really low test scores, whereas my night students, while their scores were not all stellar, you know, they didn't all make A's, but they did well, they, they, they did consistently, okay? The ones that came to class are what brought this up. The ones that, you know, for whatever reason, they weren't there most of the time, they brought this up, okay? So that's, that's just an idea, another idea from the end of chapter three. Now I want to look at this regression discovery exercise. This actually goes along with chapter two. This is not chapter three, this is actually chapter two. What we're gonna do here completely is use the calculator for this. but we're gonna do it for the arithmetic. You can create the scatter plot on your calculator and I'll show you how to do that. But I want us first, and I want you to follow along with me. I'm gonna do the first couple with you. I want you to plot these graphs by hand. So we're gonna go through first and plot all the graphs. And all we're doing here is plotting points. We're just gonna plot the points. And we're probably gonna come back to this worksheet later because there's other things on this worksheet that I don't want to talk about today. 
What I want to talk about today is mostly the scatter plots. Okay? So on this scatter plot, we're given this set of data. We don't know what it is. It's just some set of numbers that somebody came up with from somewhere. And it's these are the points that we want to put on this graph. So the first point is 1, 10. Now, the first thing to be aware of is that as hard as I tried when I made these graphs, I can't get this stuff to line up like it should. This is 1, that's 2, that's 3, that's 4, that's 5, and that's 6, okay? And see, I think it works out the same way on this one. This is 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20 is at the very top. So they're not quite lined up with their um, lines. So the first point is 110. So we go right one and up to 10. And there's your first point. Our second point is 212. So we go to two and then go up to 12. And then we go to 212 again. And in order to show that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put an X on top of it to show that it came up twice. And then the next one is 314. And the next one is 416. And then 518. And 518 shows up twice. So again, I'll put an X to show that there's actually two of those. And then 620. What do you notice about those points? They're all in a fairly straight line. In fact, if I lay a ruler down on this, I can draw a line and it connects up all the points. Agreed? Now, if I wanted to find the regression equation by hand, I could. You may or may not be able to because I don't remember what all was in the lesson on graphing. But I could find the equation of this line if I wanted to. The only thing I want you to notice is slope. And I don't want you to give me a number. I'm not interested in the number of the slope. What I'm interested in is, is the slope positive, negative, or zero? Okay, the slope is positive. That was the connection. That's the only connection I want you to make. It is a positive slope. Now let's go up a little bit further and look at the next one. We have another set of points. The first one is 113. Remember, these are offset just like the first ones were. So here's 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20 is at the very top. First point is 113, so I'll go over to 1. And this is 12, so this would be 13. And then I have 211. So I go to 2, and I go up to 10, and that makes 11. And then I have 216. So I go up to 16. So I have two different points for x equals 16. Then I have 313. So I go 3, and then I go up to 13. And 419. And 514. And 518.5. Let's see, that would be 1819. That'd be about there. And then 619. Does that look like that they would fit a straight line? No. 
In fact, if I tried to draw a straight line, it would be, you know, I could draw one through there and kind of split the difference in all of them. And it might look something like that. I'm just going to dot this in. Now, if I were to draw a line that kind of indicates the direction that they take, the slope that they take, would that slope be positive or negative? It's still positive. And that's because they're still going uphill. Okay? Here I see a very strong linear pattern. Here I really don't. Okay? Let's go on to the next page for a minute. And we've got three more. So we're going to do them all again, except we have different numbers this time. Here I've got 1 is paired with 13. So that would be right here. 2 is paired with 17. Two is paired with 14.1. Three is paired with 17.2. Four is paired with 13. Five is paired with 12. Six is paired, or I'm sorry, five is paired also with 16. And six is square paired with 15.7. Do those make any kind of a linear pattern? No. No, they don't. Did I miss this? Let's see. 3 is 17.2. So there's 12, 14, 15. You're right. Should be up here. And I did not bring my white out, so we're just going to have to agree that that's not there. <coughs> so kind of ignore this one. But even if we don't ignore it, does anybody see a really linear pattern among all of them? I mean, granted, we could probably find a few that line up, but the others, are, they'd be way off the line, right? In fact, if I were to draw a line through them, I could draw it pretty much anywhere I wanted to, but as far as the slope, a horizontal line would fit as good as anything else does, right? So the slope of the regression line here would probably be zero. Now if I go to the one underneath it and plot those points, the first one is 118, 220, 215, 318, 412, 517, 512.5, 5, and 612. Do they make a very linear pattern? Man, not really. Not really. 
I mean, if I tried to draw a line kind of like through the middle of them, most of them don't really fit on the line. They mostly fall off of it. But do they all tend to kind of travel downhill together? Yeah. Yeah, so what would you say about the slope? It's negative. And again, I'm not asking you to calculate the slope. All we look at is the line traveling uphill, downhill, or is there maybe no uphill or downhill at all? They're just kind of traveling across. Now we'll go to the last one. One twenty, two eighteen, another two eighteen, three sixteen, four fourteen, five twelve, and then another five twelve, and then six ten. Do those points connect up with a straight line pretty well. Yes, they do. What about the slope of that line? So that line has a negative slope. So M is going to be negative. Now we're going to back up. We're going to do some calculations. Now you'll discover when we get to chapter 10, the last chapter we're going to cover, that what we're doing today has big, long, horribly ugly formulas that we're never going to use. Okay? I don't believe in using formulas if you don't have to. But what we can do is we can do some stuff on the calculator, and we're not really going to focus in on everything the calculator is going to tell us today. Um, I'm not going to talk much about coefficient of variation, or determination, I'm sorry, not variation, determination. We're not going to talk too much about that today, not on any of these. We'll come back to this handout later and revisit it. So you can just kind of make a note for yourself that we're not going to, we're not going to talk about the coefficient of determination. We'll talk about that later. And we're not really going to talk about the correlation coefficient, except in a very um, kind of cursory way. We're just going to try to make a connection. So what we're going to focus on is what we've kind of already looked at, that the slope is positive or negative. And we're going to let the calculator find the equation that fits through those the best. So here's what we're going to do. Turn your calculator on, go to your stat button. And what we've always done is we go to list one and list two and we type in the table. So we're going to type in that first table. And then we're going to right arrow to go to the second list and we're going to type in the y values. And then obviously I've got to go back and check mine out because I must have typed something wrong. Yeah, I think I see why I did something wrong. Let's go back up here. Okay. So just type your numbers into list one and list two for X's and Y's.
and then I want you to hit your stat button again and go over to calc go down and choose number four Now, how many people do not see R squared and R? Okay, those people that put your hands up, follow along with me. You only need to do this once. If you don't see R squared and R, press your second and your zero button, which will take you to catalog. Use your down arrow key to scroll down through all those options. This is everything calculator knows how to do. Some of it, I don't even know what it is. I know the things we use. And right now, your diagnostics are turned off if you didn't see R and R squared. So put your little triangle in front of diagnostic on and hit enter two times. And then if you'll go back to stat and over to calc, and go down and choose number four, you should see those. Does everybody see those now? No? formulas when we get to chapter 10 and go, oh my God, it'll take me all day, but it won't. Anybody? 
Okay, what this is telling you, and we're not going to focus a lot on, on the meaning of this, but what this is telling you, the regression line, the, the equation of this line that I drew, that equation is y equals 2x plus 8. The number in front of x is 2. The number after x is 8. So this is the equation of that line. We didn't have to do slope intercept form and pick two points or any of that stuff. We have the equation of the line calculator gave it to us. What is, what do we call the number two? What function does it have in that equation? That's the slope. So the slope is indeed positive. It's positive two, right? Now the only other number I want you to look at right now is the correlation coefficient, which is r. What I want to tell you about R, and this is not absolutely imperative that you remember this for right now, but R tells you how strong that fit is for those data points in that line. How closely do they come to each other? And in this case, it says R is equal to 1. Notice that it's a positive one. Just R for right now. I'll only mention R squared. I don't really want to talk about what it means. I'll tell you how they came up with it. Okay, so looking only at the correlation coefficient, there's some connections I want you to make here. The slope of the regression line was positive. The correlation coefficient was also positive. The value 1 simply tells us that the correlation is perfect, that all of those points are actually on that line. They actually fall on the line, okay? R is between positive 1 and negative 1. R can be negative if the slope is negative. Now, the only thing you need to take away from this right now is that r squared is literally the value of r, which is 1 squared, which is, of course, 1. Okay? That's as, that's as complicated as it gets. Don't really need to focus on coefficient of determination at all other than it's literally that r number times itself. That's it. We'll talk about its meaning when we get to chapter 10. Now what we want to do is we want to go down to the second set of data, and we're going to do the same thing again, so go back to STAT and to your lists. And you can keep the same X list you had before because the X's haven't changed. If you notice, that's the same, that same X list is used for every one of these. Okay? What's going to change is the Y values. So we're going to modify the Y values So all I did was change the y values to match the second problem. And then we're going to do the same thing again. Stat, over to calc, choose number four. If you use list other than list one and list two, you're going to need to tell it what two lists you use. Like if you use list four and list five, then it's second four comma second five. You need to tell it which two lists you're using, unless you always use list one and two. And then uh, if you've got the, the newer calculators, the 84s, and some of the really new 84s, you're going to have to go down to where it says calculate and hit enter. Now I'm going to let mine default because it's going to list one and two. 
Now I want you to notice here again, it gave us the equation of the line that fits. We're going to round that off. Y is equal to 1.193 times x plus 11.261. Uh, you don't want to round it to 1 because the slope isn't exactly 1. It would be okay to round it to 1.2. And it would be okay to round this to 11.3. That would be all right. In my math lab, when we come to this, just round the way it tells you to. Because okay. it's cranky about that. If you round the three and it wanted two, it goes, no, that's not right. Okay? Now, we said the slope of that line is positive. Is it? Yes. What's the correlation coefficient? What's the value of R? Okay, 0.675. Is that very close to 1? I don't think it is. It's closer to 0.5 than it is to 1. So, is basically what that's telling you, it's, it's still positive. Okay, it's still positive. But it's not very close to 1, and these points don't come very close to that line. Right? So we don't say there's no correlation at all because they do kind of go uphill together, but they don't fit a line very well. Okay? They don't really make a nice tight line. Now, the last part to remember is all you're going to do is you're going to take 0.675 approximately and square it, and that's all you need to know about that other number. Let's see, we'll call that 5, 6. So it literally is just this number squared. That's all our square is. We'll talk about what it means later. So you can fill it in, but don't worry about it. Okay? Now let's work on the next page. And again, all we're going to do is change the Y list. Because the X's are still the same. So the Y list now is 13, 17, 14.1, 17.2, 13, 12, 16, 15.7. And then we're going to go find the equation of what the calculator thinks is a line that would come closest to all of those points. So we go to stat, over to calc, down to number four. If you kept the same two lists, just keep going right on down to calculate. And when we hit enter, this is what you should see. What does it say the slope of that line is? Zero. And zero times x means zero is not even in the equation, right? Zero is just gone. I mean, I can fill it in. And B tells us it's 14.75. That's the y-intercept of the equation, and that looks pretty close right there to me to 14.75. How about you? Mm -hmm. So really the equation here 
is just a horizontal line. But a horizontal line has zero slope. And what does it say the correlation coefficient is? Zero. And of course, when you square zero, you still get zero. So what does the correlation coefficient of zero mean? It means this data doesn't fit a straight line at all. There is no relationship between these numbers. They're all doing their own thing. Okay? They're not paying any attention to each other. They're just doing whatever they want to do. Zach, you had a question. It was because A equals zero. But the calculator on this particular function doesn't use M for the slope. So we have to remember that the slope is the number in front of X. And the calculator calls it A, and we usually call it M. Okay? So we have two more times. So we'll go to the one in the middle now. And again, go back to stat, enter, and go over to list two and change the Y numbers again. This time they're 18, 20, 15, 18, 12, 17, 12.5, 12 and 12, and recalculate. Once you recalculate, the line. It's called a regression line. It has other names too, but for right now we're just going to call it regression line. So calculate for me the regression line equation. And this is what I get. Make sure you get the same thing I do. So what's the slope of this regression equation? And that is indeed negative, right? As we predicted it would be. What do you notice? Let's see, let me put the y-intercept up there. My line wasn't very good because I actually overshot the 19.7, but I was just kind of guessing. Okay, what do you notice about the correlation coefficient? It's also negative. It's negative 0.675, which means that, again, that's just R squared is 0.4456. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to focus on this. Is it very close to negative 1? No, it's closer to 0.5. So 0 .4, 0 0.5 says it's not that there's no relationship whatsoever. It's just not a very strong one. You know, Y may be looking and, you know, maybe think a little bit about what X did, but not much. Okay? It's not that there's no relationship, but there's not a strong relationship. Not only is there not a strong relationship, but the relationship is negative. When it's negative, that means when x values go up, the y values go down, which causes a negative slope. Okay? So that kind of makes sense. Notice that on every one we've done so far, the sign of the correlation coefficient and the sign of the slope are always the same. Okay? And then on the last one, again, we'll change just the y values. And the y values are 20, 18, 18, 16, 14, 12, 12, 10. And then we'll recalculate. And so for our last set of data, 
Does it surprise you that it says the slope is negative 2? No. And the y-intercept appears to be 22, which actually is not too bad, far off from the line I drew. So the slope was indeed negative. It was negative 2. What's the correlation coefficient? It's also negative, but it's negative 1. And here again, 1 means it's the strongest possible relationship. It basically means that every single point falls on the line. None of them fall off the line. But it also tells you that their values are descending as x ascends, so it's a negative slope. Okay? Hang on to this. We will come back to this when we get to chapter 10. All I want you to do right now is focus on it, and you can mark these answers if you want to, but we're not really looking at the correlation. If the slope of the regression line was positive, what did we notice about the correlation coefficient? It was positive. And if the slope of the regression line was negative, what did we notice about the correlation coefficient? It was negative. When the slope of the regression line was zero, the graph was a horizontal line. And then the rest of it we're going to ignore for right now. We're going to come back to this, so hang on to it, stash it away. I'm also, it's also posted, so if you need it again, you can get it. But that's what we need to know about correlation. Now I'm going to give you a little quiz here and see if you can answer some questions for me. Is this a positive correlation or a negative correlation? Positive or negative? Positive, negative? I don't know. That's a parabola. That's a parabola. That's a good observation. Thank you. So let's go back and interpret a little bit because I'm not going to tell you the answer to this one just yet. This is a positive correlation. Is it strong? Yes. Yes. Now, does that mean that they lined up perfectly? No. Only that it was strong. Because you can, you can almost visualize a line going down through there and the point's coming pretty close to that line. Is this one, this one's negative, but is it strong or is it weak? It's strong. The way we would interpret this is this is a strong, positive, linear relationship. That word linear is important. It is a strong, positive, linear relationship. Just like this is a strong negative linear relationship. And this one tells you there is no 
linear. relationship whatsoever. No relationship at all. Zero means none. Okay? This one does have a relationship. There is a relationship between X and Y, right? Is the relationship linear? No. You say there is no linear relationship, okay? Because its correlation coefficient would also be fairly close to zero if we were to calculate it. Because the only way to come anywhere cl close to the dots is to kind of split the difference and put a horizontal line through them. That doesn't mean there's no relationship whatsoever. It means there is no linear relationship. That's important. No linear relationship. All we're talking about on all of these is whether or not you see a linear pattern, not just a pattern. Okay? Now, one last thing. Let's see, where did I put it? This is going to be posted. Come on, you can do it. I'm going to highlight it when I post it. But I'm going to show you what I'm highlighting right now. And we're going to talk about these for a minute because you do have symbols to memorize in problem stats. Like we said in chapter one, problem stats, a lot of the problem with problem stats is that it's a foreign language. And I've heard you all say that you think algebra is a foreign language and I tend to agree with you. The ones that you need to memorize, and these are important, and my suggestion is that you get yourself some index cards, put a symbol on the front and the name of it on the back, and just flip through them and quiz yourself on Because you, by the time we get to the final exam, this is going to be 10 points, or actually it's going to be eight, it's eight questions on your 50 question final exam is symbols. Okay? Your 50 question final exam in December is going to have eight questions asking you what the symbols of things are. So you're going to eventually need to know all of these. But right now, the ones that you need to know just for test one. Capital N is the population size. And I'm going to give you this handout so you can use this to make it for yourself. Little n is sample size. Little f is frequency. The name of that character is sigma. Okay? And sigma, the word for it is summation, but sigma means Find the sum. That's all it means. Add them up. And the reason you have sigma is it tells you how to find the population and the sample means. So those are used in formulas, but you need to know what they mean. So the population mean is also a Greek character. And that, even though it looks like a U, 
the name for it is new, N-U, like a cat says. And it really is a Greek M. And when you start seeing it that way, you realize it's an M. It's not really a U. Your sample mean and all sample statistics always have more English-like looking letters in them. So Greek goes with population. And English-looking English symbols go with sample. Okay? These are both standard deviations. You are not required to memorize the formula for them. These are both variances, which is simply the standard deviation squared. But the thing here is, again, realize Greek means that it was a population. And the English means that it was a sample. Those are all you have to memorize for now. That's as far as you need to go. Most of the rest of these are going to come up in chapter five, four and five. So as far as names, this is the population mean, mu. This is the population standard deviation, which is also sigma, but it's lowercase. That's a lowercase sigma. Even though I know it looks like an S, its name is sigma. And this is simply sigma squared. Okay. Uh, let me find it because I'm pretty sure I downloaded it. Mm, not yet. going to put your practice test up and make sure you can all find it. This is your practice test. It is in Shobi. You can download it and print it out if you want to. You can do it in Shobi if you want to. How you do it is up to you. The answers will be posted tomorrow. Probably by early afternoon tomorrow. It will be just answers. It won't be any long detailed answers. So if you have questions, you need to post questions in the folder in Shobi if you have questions about these. One thing I will point out to you, there will be multiple choice questions on the test. There will be questions like this on the test.
There are, you can ignore, you don't have to actually sketch the scatter plot, okay? You should be able to sketch one by hand if you want to do it on the calculator and you want to follow along and find out. I didn't cover sketching the calculator scatter plot, so you don't really have to sketch that one on question 38. Part A is not necessary. But you do need to consider whether or not this would look linear, so you may want to take a piece of graph paper and plot out the point. The question here is, does there seem to be a relationship, and if it is it linear or nonlinear, and if it's linear, is it positive or negative? And then the last question, everybody in here should be able to answer this one right now. Okay. There's 39 questions on your practice test. The actual test, I think, has 20 or 23 or 25, something like that. It's not nearly this long. Because this is for practice, there's a lot of extra questions. Okay? Now, you can hang out for the rest of class, and I will answer questions, do whatever you need to do, but the test is on Wednesday.